awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. So yeah, so this is my talk. Uh, when Rotten Tomatoes isn't enough. So we're going to be analyzing Twitter movie reviews with Datastax Enterprise. So let's talk about what we're actually going to talk about. What problem are we really trying to solve here? So what we're going to do is an introduction to Apache Cassandra, what it is, why do I need it, a very quick introduction to Apache Spark, what it is, why do I need it. Uh, I have a strong feeling that this group is very familiar with these things, but we're just going to do a really light touch on both of these items, and then we're going to go into uh, a live demo. So, And then we're going to talk about what is sentiment analysis, because we're going to do a little bit of data science here. We're going to do an overview of the demo I'm going to do, and then we're going to do an actual live demo. All right, so you already heard enough about me, but this is a little bit about me. It's pretty much the same thing. Okay, so what problem are we really trying to solve here? We're trying to solve what movie should I see? So wouldn't it be great if I could ask a million people this question? Wouldn't it be even greater if I could automate this process? So basically, data analytics and data science doesn't have to be complicated. So we're going to utilize the power of big data using Apache Cassandra, Apache Spark, the Spark uh, machine learning libraries, Jupyter Notebooks, Python, PySpark, which I didn't mention here, Twitter Tweets and the Twitter Dev API, and we're going to use Pattern, which is actually a Python package for sentiment analysis. Okay, so we're going to do the world's briefest introduction to Apache Cassandra. <laughs> All right, what exactly is it? And this group, again, Apache Cassandra has been around for 10 years, so this group is probably pretty familiar with what it actually is, but let's just do a high level for people who aren't familiar with it. Uh, it was developed by Facebook, again, about 10 years ago, and it became a top-level Apache project um, in 2010. So here's the key. It is a distributed, decentralized database. These are the key words that you need to keep remembering. So it's elastically scalable. You can add and remove nodes with no downtime. It has uh, very high performance. It's very fast. It has high availability and fault tolerance. There is no single point of failure. And we're going to talk a little bit about that here in the next couple of slides. Um, and it solves many of the problems that you might face with a traditional database for certain workloads. All right, so uh, I work for data, data stacks. Uh, so I just want to do a quick uh, just little plug for data stacks enterprise. Basically, they have a lot of the key contributors uh, to the Apache Cassandra project. And it's the commercial product uh, around uh, uh, Apache uh, Cassandra. That's a lot of cool features, more QA, and more support. And actually, the demo that I'm going to do for you is actually just a, a one-node uh, DataStax Enterprise Analytics node just here on my laptop. All right, so what does this all mean? So let's talk about four big topics. We're going to talk about distributed, replication, elastically scalable, and high availability. Now, like I said before, this is a super brief intro. So for more information, we actually have, uh, it's called DataStax Academy. It's actually totally free courses on all these things I'm going to talk about and way more. So if you're interested in any of the things I'm talking about, check this out. It's totally free. All right. So distributed. Every node in the cluster has exactly the same role. And I put here, really. Because sometimes you kind of hear about these things and you're not sure if they're actually true. But this is actually true. Cassandra does not have a master worker architecture. So every client can connect to any node because every node is exactly the same. All nodes are available for reads and writes, and they're all ready. Um, but this is not to say that all nodes have all of the same data. That's not very scalable. All right, so replication. Here we are. We're talking about the data and where it resides. So to be able to survive a node going down, data must be copied to other nodes. So if any of you, I mean, we're all big data people. You're all familiar with HDFS. You're all familiar with these types of things. So replication factor is something you're very uh, used to. But this is something that's set by the user. So in Cassandra, you can set this anywhere from just one. I just have one replica of my data up to uh, the number of nodes that you have in your cluster, which uh, is not actually recommended, but you could do it if you want to. Normally, the recommendation around uh, replication is three. So the data is asynchronously replicated uh, automatically. So there's peer-to-peer -peer communication. All right, so elastically scalable. So the more nodes that are added, the performance actually increases linearly, which is important because not only can you add the nodes, but you're getting, um, you're getting that increased performance. So you can scale up and scale down uh, with no downtime. You don't even need a restart to add nodes. And the reads and writes both scale. All right, so high availability. This is kind of one of the key points besides the distributed decentralized database. 
But the lack of the master node allows for high availability because there is no single point of failure. So replication allows nodes to fail and data to still be available. So Cassandra expects nodes to fail. That's what it was built for. It has this already built in. It knows it's going to happen, and it doesn't panic when it does happen. So it also has multiple data center support right out of the box. Um, you can just have a US data center and a Europe data center uh, very easily. It just has to be configured in a YAML file. All right, so one small trade off because I've been talking about all the amazing things of Cassandra. Uh, and I know sometimes people get up here and they want to talk about their product and how amazing it is and how magical. But we do have one small trade off, and it is very small, but I want to bring it up, especially for a tech crowd. And this all evolves around the CAP theorem which is, uh, if you don't know about it, uh, you should Google it. It's actually very interesting, but it's about availability, consistency, and partition tolerance in a network. Um, so basically, a database cannot have all of these. It's impossible. You can't have all three, and you can see in this chart here. So what Cassandra decides to do is it wants to be highly available. And so because of that, it chooses that it's going to have eventual consistency. So that's the default. But you can prioritize your consistency of your data um, over availability. So these are all configurable things. It's just really about what's important to you. Think about whether you have um, data that's important to you or data that maybe is not as important, like likes on a Twitter tweet. So the cons like I said, the consistency levels are configurable. So you can have, um, and here's another easy equation, is that the right consistency plus the reconsistency, as long as that's greater than your replication factor, you have, you have strong consistency. OK, so why would I need Apache Cassandra? So basically, in this group, I think you pretty much have a really good understanding of this. But if you have a big data, do you need to be able to read and write fast? Do you need to be able to scale up and scale down easily? Do you, have, uh, do you need high availability, which you probably do? Do you need multiple data center support for your application? Do you, have, do you need multi-cloud or hybrid cloud support? If you need any of these things, you probably need Cassandra. All right, now this is the world's quickest introduction to Apache Spark. OK, so what is Apache Spark? Apache Spark is a unified analytics engine for large scale data processing. So I'm just going to highlight this term right here, analytics engine. It's going to help us do our analytics, especially here in this demo. So it's 100 times faster than Hadoop, and it utilizes in-memory processing and amazing parallelism to actually get that. And so we're going to be talking about it has uh, quite a few things that uh, Spark has, but we're going to be talking about the machine learning libraries. OK, so why would you need Spark? Again, this is a super quick light intro to Spark. If you have big data, do you need high availability? Do you need analytics at lightning speed? And if you need insights into your data, you might want to consider using Spark. OK, so now we're going to start talking about kind of the overarching thing of this talk, which is the Twitter movie reviews. So what is sentiment analysis? What are we going to try to do here with data science? OK, so. At a very high level, now you could talk about sentiment analysis, probably you could have whole courses on it. But for this case, we're just going to talk at a very high level, and it's very simple. It's basically natural language processing and text analytics to determine if a word in a sent or a sentence is positive, negative, or neutral. So this is very easy for us to understand um, at a high level, but it's very difficult for machines to learn how to do. But also think about us in this day and age with text messages. Think how difficult it is, even when like somebody sends you like a text message and they say hi and they put a period, right? You have to figure out what that person means. Are they happy? Are they neutral? Are they sad? So even for us, it's getting more difficult to understand what people actually mean with what they type. So imagine for a machine to try to figure that out. Okay, so let's do an overview of the demo. Alrighty. So what we're going to do is I have a local Datastax Enterprise Analytics setup here on my laptop. It's just a one node cluster. Cluster. I have a local Jupyter Notebook setup here on my laptop. So we're going to pull Twitter data on a movie title. So in this particular instance, we're going to use Mission Impossible. Um, we're going to clean up the tweets. We're going to insert um, that data into Cassandra. And we're going to create a Spark data frame from that. Because DSC Analytics, which I didn't really talk about here, but it has that all integrated right in the box. And you'll see how easy it is for us to move from Cassandra to Spark. We're going to use Spark uh, machine learning libraries. We're going to do sentiment analysis with Pattern, which is a Python package. And it's going to give us the positive or negative. We're going to take an average of all the scores. And then we're going to decide, should I actually see this movie or not? 
OK, so let's get to the demo. All right, so it's a Jupyter Notebook. And I can make it bigger. It might be too big. All right. So it may be a little bit difficult to see uh, in the back, but I do have this on my GitHub and anybody's free to download it. So let's just start walking through this Jupyter Notebook. So I have, again, if you wanted to download this from my GitHub, I have all the steps on what you would need to do to actually get it set up and just running on your laptop. So we won't walk over the, through those. Uh, it's not that interesting, but it looks like it's a lot of steps, but it's actually the complete amount of steps. It probably would only take you 20 minutes to get this all set up and running. These are just some environment variables that you would need. You import some packages in Python. Uh, this is just a helper, nice function to do some like nice formatting, pretty printing for Spark data frames. All right, so now let's get to Datasex uh, Enterprise Analytics. So we're going to create the table, we're going to pull the tweets, and we're going to load the table. So we're using the Python, Datasex Python Cassandra driver. And so here, this is all we need to do to actually connect to our cluster. And like I said, it's a one node cluster just running here on my laptop. So I'm just co connecting to local hosts here. I get my cluster object and I'm able to create a session just that easily. From there, we're actually gonna create a key space. Now a key space in Cassandra is similar to, if you're familiar with Oracle, it's like a, 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 a schema, or if you're familiar with Teradata, it's like a database. And so we're gonna set that up. We're gonna use a simple strategy and we're gonna use our replication factor, which I talked about before. We're just gonna set that to one uh, because there's no point in replicating my data because I only have one node. <laughs> and next we're gonna actually just set our key space. And now we're gonna set up our movie title. So in this case, we're gonna search on Mission Impossible. And we're gonna search, uh, we're gonna search for positive tweets and negative tweets. So we're gonna create two tables in Cassandra uh, for this movie title one for the positive and one for the negative. So Twitter, actually the Twitter dev API, if any of you are familiar with it, it's actually really awesome. You can get a ton of real time information about basically anything you wanna search for. So you can, it actually gives you a ton of information, um, way more than we need for just the sake of this demo. So we're just gonna utilize the Twitter ID as our primary key to what actually we wanna partition our data by uh, because it's unique. And then we're gonna get the actual tweet. So just a little note here, um, you may want to think about when you're actually distributing your data at scale with Cassandra, if that primary key of your Twitter ID is really the right thing to partition by. Um, in this case, because I just have one node, it doesn't really matter, but it is something to consider like for your data model uh, when you're choosing your primary key. So we're going to create both of those tables. So from there, we're going to actually set up our search terms for gathering tweets uh, from the Twitter API. So what's really cool about uh, Twitter and their APIs, what I noticed when I was working on this demo, is they actually do a first pass of sentiment analysis on the Twitter tweets. And you can actually search that literally by a happy face or a sad face. And they it's actually true. And they will give you back either positive tweets or negative tweets. Um, and we'll see as we go through this, actually their uh, their first pass at it with the positive tweets is, is spot on. You almost always get positive tweets. For some reason, whatever algorithm that they're using um, for the negative tweets, you, you don't always get negative. I'm not quite sure why I've been playing with it now for a couple of weeks. It, it doesn't really seem to work, but the positive seems to be spot on. But we'll see more about that as we walk through this. All right, so now I'm gonna have another function here that's actually gonna clean up the tweets. We're gonna remove the emojis, flags, special characters, URLs, and we're gonna remove RT because when you pull in the Twitter data, it actually for retweets, it just puts this RT in there. I just removed it just to make it a little easier for the sentiment analysis function, um, just in case so I wouldn't get confused. Um, and actually it would be pretty great if we could do sentiment analysis around emojis because a lot of emotion comes through with those emojis. But in this case, we just, we just remove them. Alrighty. So then to be able to use Twitter and their API, you have to set up some keys and things like that. And they walk you through it all in their, um, their URLs and their links. Um, so I got that all set up here. All right. So this cell, we're actually going to pull the tweets from Twitter. So the maximum number of tweets you can pull at any one time for free is only 100. So you can actually run this code a couple times to pull more and more. So once the tweets are collected, let's loop over the list clean up the tweets, and then insert them into the table. So we have a large for loop around here that surrounds this to make uh, one call for the positive and one for the negative. And then we also have to URL encode our happy face and our sad face. So that's what this is doing here. 
And because this is a very techie crowd, you'll notice I have a comment here. I actually have a comment on the actual insert. We're not actually not gonna insert this because I already found some really great data that I wanted to show you. So even though if we could, if we could pull it live, we're not inserting it into the table. <laughs> So let's, so we're seeing actually some of the tweets that got pulled live just when I ran this just a little bit ago. And these are all about Mission Impossible. So then we can do a select star on the table and verify that the tweets were actually inserted into our Cassandra table. And so we can see here that they were. So let's scroll down. All right, so now we're starting to get to some analytics with Apache Spark. So now it's actually time for that. So let's, so what we're gonna do in this one line of code here, <laughs> is we're able to take our uh, Apache Cassandra table and load it into a Spark data frame. And so we're gonna create two Spark data frames, one for positive tweets and one for negative tweets. And just this one line of code right here will move all the data from uh, Cassandra into Spark. Now, really, I think, again, this is all just around one node, but imagine this at scale, right? And how easy that was to do. And then we're just gonna take a count of how many rows I got for each. So it looks like I have 50 tweets for the positive and 75 for the negative. So now we're gonna actually use those machine learning libraries to break up the uh, sentences into actual words. So we're gonna use the Spark tokenizer and it's gonna cut up the, the sentence into individual words. And we're gonna do that for the positive and for the negative. And you can see we just print out the data frame here. It shows the tweet when it's cut up into words, and then how many words were in each uh, tweet. All right, so then the next thing that we're gonna do, is so we're actually gonna remove all the stop words. Um, anything that has like, if you're familiar with of, a, the, none of that's actually important to the sentiment. So we're actually gonna strip those out. And so we're using again, uh, the Spark Machine Learning Library stop words remover, and we're gonna do that again for the positive and for the negative. And so we can already start seeing some interesting things here. Um, we see the number of tokens that are originally, so number of words in each sentence. And then once we remove the stop words, how many words we have left. All right, so now let's actually get to our sentiment analysis. So we're gonna convert each Spark data frame to a Pandas data frame. Now, I just wanna let everyone know that this works as is because I'm working on my laptop. Anyone who's familiar with Spark and data science and big data knows that Pandas just runs locally wherever you're running it from, be it your laptop or server. So to just move from one to the other, you have to make sure that when you're moving from one to the other, that you have the memory to actually do that. So again, it just works because it's here on my laptop, but it's something to consider. So then we're gonna loop through each of the rows and we're actually gonna get a sentiment score and we're gonna get on each tweet, we're gonna get whether it's positive, so it's like a positive number, or it's negative, which means it's a, a negative sentiment, or we'll get a zero. Zero can mean neutral, or zero can mean I don't have enough information to score this. I really don't know what it means. So then we're actually gonna have the assessment function, which is part of the pattern uh, package. And it's gonna show whether the word, uh, that what words that we use to judge whether this was positive or negative. Okay. So this here's the Python code here for this. So, okay, so these are some of the tweets that we've gotten. So here's an example. I wanna watch Mission Impossible. Um, has anyone watched it yet? And then a sad face. So it's not really a movie review, but it is a, a real-time tweet that I just pulled not too long ago. And so this, uh, in this case, it got scored as 0 0.3. So kind of a negative sentiment. Um, other people, let's see, let's see if we can scroll down here. All right, so we have our Here's our nice data frame here printed out. We have our original tweet, the score, whether it's positive or negative, and why we decided uh, that score that we did, so the assessment. So straight away, we're seeing something interesting here on our assessment. We're seeing the word impossible. So we'll come back to that here in a bit. So let's do the same thing with our positive tweets. And actually, and another thing I forgot to mention is as we go through, we're actually taking an average of the scores um, so that we can kind of make a rough estimate of whether we should see this movie or not. Okay. So here's like Mission Impossible Fall is great. So we got a 0 0.8. So that's a very positive feeling about that. And we can see straight away in our assessment that it gave the word great. And it said, okay, that's why I'm going to weigh it so 
highly on the positive because great is such a positive word. All righty. So we're finally to the end here. Should I see this movie? So basically how I'm saying in just my demo here is if the average of all the positive scores is greater than the average of the negative scores, I'm saying, hey, go out there, go see this movie. People like it. Or if they're equal, I'm saying, hey, go take a chance. People are split. And if the positive rating is actually less than the negative rating, I'm saying, oh, people don't like this movie. All righty. So our final positive rating score is 0.2. Not that positive. And our negative score is actually negative 0.4. So we're saying people don't like this movie. So is this the answer that you were expecting? So when we look at Rotten Tomatoes for Mission Impossible, it has a super high score. So maybe we need to, either way, we really need to go back and take a look at our data. We need to, it, data science is an iterative process. So let's kind of scroll back up here to those negative reviews that we saw. What do we keep seeing over and over again in our assessment? The word impossible. Now, because Mission Impossible is in the movie title, maybe I should have removed that when I was removing my stop words, right? Because the movie title doesn't have any weight on the actual assessment. It's just, it's just there. It's the movie title. So because we had that word impossible, it feels like it's really negative. So if I had removed that, then we could probably get something much higher uh, for the positive and the negative because it wouldn't have those negative words. All righty. So here's just some important links um, so that you can learn more about Cassandra and Spark and Datastax. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. Um, and our team is just recently, uh, we're getting involved with live demos uh, on Twitch. So feel free to check that out. Like I said, this is on GitHub. And uh, definitely check out the Datastax Academy because all this information is totally free. Thank you. Oh yeah, and so I forgot to mention, <laughs> But because it's late, so I have eight t-shirts here that have my cool superhero. So for the eight people who want to ask questions, you get a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, if I missed it, what was the revised score when you uh, removed Impossible from the sentiment? I actually haven't removed it, yeah. Right. But I'm, I, have, I have strong feelings that it would be much higher. Yeah. Sure. And do you have any other intuition about what's affecting the distribution? Um, I think it was definitely, so we can kind of go back here. I think it was, yeah, you're kind of seeing here all along, it's that word impossible. Right, yeah, oh, here's a word old, uh, much, I don't know why it gave that a negative sure. connotation, but yeah, it's really around that impossible word. So is the next thing I mean, people saying, I haven't seen it, I want to see it, I want to watch it, I want to binge watch it, I haven't, you know. Right, Should so that, that's a, the next pass, right? The next pass would be to actually pull out, right, again, data science, the iterative process, actually pulling out proper reviews. Because in this case, I'm just searching just on the word mission right. impossible, right? You could add yeah. much more to that to actually pull even proper reviews. Fold out or five or something. Right, right. As opposed to I just kind of pulled and then just kind of playing with the data from there. Thank yeah. You. So um, your company, Data Stacks, is this uh, um, some kind of um, uh, coaching institute or what is it? Oh, Data Stacks is the enterprise uh, product around Apache Cassandra. So the, how I did actually this demo is, is based on our product. Yeah. So we're the, the commercial version of Apache Cassandra. So that's two shirts. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, um, yeah, okay. how, had you not moved to Pandas, uh, how, how good is the integration between Spark and Cassandra about uh, partition awareness and locality? So there is a Spark worker on every node. So, so, so for every Cassandra node, there's a, a for on DataStacks Enterprise, I should say. Um, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> then we have it on. Yeah, that's uh, that's part of our commercial offering is that we have that and it's tightly coupled and we've done a lot of work around that. But now if you're using actually Apache Cassandra and Apache Spark, two separate standalone, you're going to get your your results may vary. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it has no notion in, in the open source version. There's no notion of partition awareness and locality. I, I don't want to really speak to that because I don't know for a fact, but I, I'm leaning towards strongly that it probably doesn't. Because they're two separate clusters and they're just connected by a connector. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. 
Sorry, question about uh, your sentiment analysis. Yeah. So it seems to me that Mission Impossible from your NLP should have classified as a type, particular type of entity and not even showed up here. So why, why did, why, do you know what entity actually described Mission Impossible to be? So yeah, so this is, I, I, I think it's mostly around the word, I see what you're saying. It, it, it it's not the correct. It's not the correct entity in all of these because Mission Impossible should be a noun phrase, so it should not even have picked. Well, this I up. don't think it's actually picking up the word. It, so we're we're phrasing together Mission and Impossible, and we're putting those two together where it isn't because remember I tokenized, so it's just getting Mission and Impossible. It doesn't even know that they're together. So you're not fitting into NLP then? Uh, no. Okay, I thought you were. So. No. Uh, yeah, this is just kind of a, a okay. demo um, around it to just show kind of all the integrations of the technology. And second question was um, in your conversion from uh, the data frame, Inspire data frame to Pandas, did you do anything special there or just use a traditional? I just did traditional. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, my, next, my question is about uh, this is more of a static data that you pulled at the start. How does it perform when the data is more like? Um, uh, streaming like streaming like how does it compare against storm uh like in terms of applying the machine learning patterns like on a continuously changing data like stocks or something if i want to decide if i want to buy a stock or not how does that compare so do you mean like at the performance level yeah like uh, this is more like a static data yeah i mean i could have pulled it live because right because we're walking through the jupyter notebook one at a time even if i pulled the data live it's not really streaming Right. Even if I pulled it live, which I could do right now. Um, but if you did have streaming data, um, Cassandra, they have support for that for sure. Um, now the Python, like the Python packages I'm using kind of for just the sake of the demo. I'm not really sure. I can't really answer on like their performance level. Um, I know a lot of people work with pandas in production, uh, but that's not really. I'm asking more about the Spark and the Spark M ML component, like uh, the performance of that library. Yeah, I mean, I think people with a lot of more uh, Spark knowledge know a lot more about that. But it's it's uh, their Spark streaming. It's definitely based around that. I, okay. I, yeah. Okay. Any more? I do have a question. So uh, I'm new uh, to the uh, Cassandra, and I'm not sure is uh, dates uh, date uh, is NoSQL database or you have some. Uh, component to uh, run the uh, calculation. I'm a little it's, bit confused here. Um, yeah, it's a NoSQL database. And uh, so basically, the uh, machine learning, uh, not machine learning, this uh, Panda and uh, uh, Spark is run just on the cloud. It's not run. Like so um, DataStacks Enterprise actually has uh, Cassandra and Spark oh, together. Okay. Oh, I see. Now all the sentiment analysis were just purely for my demo and are not part of the product. Okay, I see. Yeah, I see. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. So my question would be: You used Cassandra here mainly in the beginning, right? And then you load it into a data frame, That's and right. after that, I—I I mean, most of the processing happens in Spark. Um, how? Did using Cassandra specifically um, help in this example? How was it better than using HBase, or was and, it better than using Bigtable? So in this particular example, I mean, it's all just running locally on my laptop, right? But if you're at scale and if you have a Cassandra database, and like I said before, kind of in like my talk, the reasons why you would need Cassandra, and then you see that easy integration with Spark. It's really about I'm kind of showing just the ease of moving between the two. But in this particular case, Cassandra was our data store. The, the ease of loading a data frame from Cassandra. Right, right. With DataStacks Enterprise, really. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Uh, sorry, you, you had that uh, cap slide before where yeah. the trade-offs were. Yeah. So you can't tell me where Cassandra lives in there? Yeah, so they are, we are, move back there. So we have um, high availability and partition tolerance so that we are an eventually consistent. So that's that's kind of the area. And that's why I, I said it was a small trade off. That's kind of the area where we have the trade off is on our consistency levels. Is this hosted? Is the code that you just explained? Is this hosted anywhere? Like yeah, this is all on GitHub. 
Yeah, okay. on my GitHub. Yeah, you're free to download it or check it out. Yeah, please do. Okay. <laughs> if you have any improvements in anything, yeah, let me know. <laughs> okay, I think we'll take one last question because sure we're running yeah. behind time. Yes, so uh, in terms of the uh, performance of uh, Cassandra, because you demo the uh, NLP, so uh, how how's, do you have any uh, benchmarking, a uh, benchmark uh, about the performance on uh, like a test text data? Um, yeah, so we have a lot of benchmarking, especially for data sex, um, analytics and our latest project, which is data sex analytics or uh, enterprise six. We have mm. a lot of performance and it's all posted online. Uh, yeah, so it's, it has very good performance. Um, I don't have any numbers or kind of comparison, which is maybe what you're looking for, but we have all that kind of posted sure, out online. Yeah. <laughs>